Well, hello, everybody. Um, I want to show you what we've got going on with AI.law uh, to help everybody in our daily lives as litigators. I'm going to share a screen. The website is AI.law, obviously. Um, gives us an idea of some of the things that we do um, as an overview right here on the website. Once you're into the um, website, once you're registered, you can go to log in, and this will bring you to the actual app, which is app.ai.law. Uh, before you're registered, you'll see a, a screen you've got to log in at. If you use your, um, your work email address, it'll recognize it as, um, as part of the organization and will give you access through the organization directly. When you log in, this is uh, there are four main items that we have for main abilities um, as of this as of today. Um, this the the discovery response is being the uh, flagship product, if you will, for AI.law, and I want to walk you through it. I want to walk you through some other things that we have as well. So in order to do this, it's it's fairly straightforward. The most important thing that you have to do is upload a copy of the documents you receive or the request you receive from opposing counsel for discovery. So I have an example here. I have a short sample discovery. And here, this is a, a fake case we've, we've created. You've got a first set of interrogatories, you got an introduction section, definition of terms, instructions, and then you've got some requests, five individual requests here, and it's a combination uh, discovery request. So we have inter a couple of inter three interrogatories, an RFA, and then a request for production. And for this particular case that I use as an example, the RFA is admit that you sign the note and mortgage in exchange for a loan in the amount of 185,000. This is a sample foreclosure we're using, but you can see even the interrogatories are general in nature, where it's identifying each person who provided information, as we'd expect, uh, lay witnesses you want to identify, and then if you deny the RFA, then support the facts in support of your denial, as well as provide any documents. So the interrogatory example is, is general with one specific uh, question regarding admitting to signing the note. And at the end, you've got the person who's serving this uh, on us and then certificate of service as well. And they're serving it on uh, uh, Jimmy T. Bones, uh, the, the lawyer here. So you've got this sample um, that we've created. This is, again, a sample we would have received from opposing counsel. Oh, I lost it here. Uh, this is an example we would have received a, a document from opposing counsel. And all you have to do is click Upload and select the document and click Open. That's it. It'll upload the document. There it is uploaded. Now, what you can do is you can also select a prior client. You can select the client's name. There's a drop down menu where if you have a new client, you can actually click new and say um, new demo client. That's what we're going to call it. Doesn't matter here what it's called, but then we're going to give this particular matter a name. So let's go uh, with um, foreclosure. So what what we've got done with AI.law with this particular functionality is the ability, we're building the ability to save and retrieve information for the particular, for each individual client. So here by selecting the client's name or entering the client's name, the idea is, is that you can go to any one of the pieces of module in within AI. And so long as you've selected the same client, all that same data will populate. So you won't have to do it over and over again, as well as because a client might have multiple matters, you can specify what kind of matter it is here under the matter name. And this is pretty much the only information you need if you wanted to run this and just get objections. Um, but you have the ability to ed enter a few little additional pieces of information, such as case type. I'm going to indicate foreclosure. Um, and, and then the next section is res clients' responses to request. So let's say if you send out the document to your client, you say, hey, do your best job at responding to each one of these. And they type in their responses after each one in the Word doc. They send the Word doc back over to you. You can simply upload that document that with the client's responses here into the system, and then it'll populate, it'll reformat and populate the document correctly using those examples. Even if they don't go and use the same request and put their answer after each one, they can still 
um, they can still put a paragraph together in a Word document. You can upload that, or you can type in their answers here or copy and paste from an email. So let's say they email you back and they say, I, I can't answer any of these, except I can tell you, I don't remember signing the, the note. So in this case, you just say, uh, client does not, uh, let's say did not sign uh, the note or mortgage. So we've got that client response. If it's blank, it's okay. It's still gonna run all the objections. It's just gonna leave out the client information. And no matter what the client information is, if it's responsive to a specific request, it will pull from this information area and populate it in. If you have any proprietary documents or confidential documents that you don't want to re, uh, send to the opposing counsel, you can upload the Word doc with those that list. You don't actually upload the proprietary document, but rather a list of those documents are indicated here, such as Coca-Cola's formula or, or recipe that you definitely would want it to consider proprietary. So you to enter that information here and then it would know to specially mark that. Finally, the responses you're going to get from this uh, system as it is with the objections are very robust. It's, it's uh, going to overkill objections. There's a way that I like to litigate cases. I like to be, they're very thorough with, with objections because you don't know if later on down the, the road, if some, dis, some information might be exchanged that we want to object to, we have to, it's preferable to have those objections already baked into the responses to discovery. So they're not waived. So if you just run this right now, it's going to give you a very robust set of responses, which is how we're going to do it. I'm going to show you. But if you've got a prior document that you have worked on for a long period of time that you really like, if you've got a, um, you know, I, I don't know, IP uh, uh, issue that you want to, uh, that your litigation issue, if you have a uh, um, personal injury or workers' compensation, a set of responses you're you're very used to responding, usually be more PI, then you can actually upload that document here in this last section, and then the system will mimic your responses. That is that if you like to not object very much, then it's not going to give you a lot of objections. It's going to follow your lead with what you upload. But this is really, again, the only thing you really need to do is upload the document and then click generate document. I like to have a timer going as this goes so you can see what happens. What it's going to do is it's going to populate, it's recreating a responsive document. It's got the, it's going to have a header just like we're used to seeing. It's going to have an objection, uh, a general objection section um, that's going to be relevant. And then it's going to pull the, the questions, the request from the requesting document into the new document, it's going to actually include them right there. And then underneath those requests, it's going to have the general, the specific objections that are relevant to that specific request. And then if the client responded, it will follow with a, a client's response. Also, because objections need to be uh, specifically um, signed by the attorney making the objection, we should see objections. Uh, under each one of them as well. Then at the end, it'll have a certificate of service. It's going to pull from the requesting document, the lawyer that sent you the request, it's gonna pull their information from that document and populate it into the responsive document. And finally, you'll have a signature section for you at the end. Um, it's, it's, good, it's fairly comprehensive and it's actually gonna give us a Word document download, that we download so we can open it up and make any kind of changes that we want to, to make to it before it actually gets served on opposing counsel. And true to form with the requests, about five requests is gonna take about a minute and a half. Um, these can take, here it's a little under a minute and a half. It's a very long document, it's gonna take longer, uh, but you'll be able to see it uh, going, moving as it moves forward. So I'm gonna generate, I'm gonna download this document. We're gonna take a look at it. Now, if there's anything that we wanna change that's major, we wanna make, um, uh, inform the, the, the system, we can actually type it in here in this section, in, uh, output not quite right and regenerate it, and then it'll rerun it with your, new instructions that you want to give to the system. But I'm going to show you what this looks like. We're going to open this up. Um, I'm going to select all. I'm going to, I'm going to change the spacing to condense so you can, we can read it all on the screen. And here you've got the responses. So you've got the, the general section, the header, the same. Response to plaintiff, Wells Fargo interrogatories. And you got your general objections. Defendant hereby responds. One. 
two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, um, not relevant. These are general objections. Um, uh, what else do we have here? Overly broad, unduly burdensome, uh, seeks a, a information attorney-client privilege, all the general objections that we normally see, and then it's going to get in the specific request. So here's an interrogatory number one, identify each person who provided information, and you're going to get a very um, robust uh, objection here that includes um, unduly burdensomely, overly, unduly burdensome, overly broad, not reasonably calculated lead to discoverable evidence. The interrogatory appears designed to improperly inquire the defendant's counsel's litigation strategy, work product, work client attorney privilege communications, all of which are improper or protected. Nevertheless, subject to the general objections and the foregoing specific objections, defendant answers the interrogatories as follows. Defendant Smith has provided information for responding to these interrogatories, requests for production documents, and RFAs. Defendant reserves the right to supplement this response as necessary. If, again, your client has produced the information that maybe goes to this to, by saying their name and assist, you know, with the assistance of counsel, you'll see that right after this. And because we have an objection, uh, we have a signature by uh, Jimmy T. Bones, which is the uh, lawyer for the client. And it continues on. Here's an interrogatory number uh, uh, five. Um, this was done out of order. If you recall, it, it actually goes one five um, within the document because we I condensed it down before I ran it. Uh, and then you've got a, a lengthy discovery section. What I do want to draw your attention to is the RFA number one that we ran, which is admit you signed the note in mortgage exchange for 185,000. And we had indicated factually that uh, we don't we didn't sign it. So we still get subject to general objections, juxta the request for on the grounds that assumes facts not in evidence, sign the note and mortgage, objects based on best evidence rule, which is pretty, pretty good, which is very detail oriented. I like including this with mine, but this is pretty deep stuff. If you've never done a foreclosure case before and want something that is helpful and robust as far as the objections, this is a pretty good one to have in there. And it continues on. And it says, subject to general objections, John Smith does not have sufficient information to answer re request several years ago, and he has not prov provided the original ins for inspection. Notwithstanding, John Smith answers the request for inter uh, RFA 1 as follows. Denies that he signed the note and mortgage in exchange for a loan in the original amount of 185000 So here it knows, without me saying, and, and put this within this admission, that this is relevant that the information provided by the client is relevant to this particular request for admission. And then you've got the final uh, our, uh, request for production, again, multiple layers of objections. And finally, as we can see, the certificate of service, it's brought in the uh, serving attorney's name and contact information here. Finally, um, we're working on having it automatically add in your name and address at the end but this just reminds you to, to, to do that. Uh, we're also uh, within a couple of days, by the time you run this yourself, there should also be a verification page that follows uh, once the system recognizes that there is at least one interrogatory um, present, it'll give you a verification page. Five pages, four substantive pages of discovery responses in a minute and a half. Folks, this would take me hours to do this, even, even with what I know about foreclosure and, and consumer work. This is hours worth of work done in a minute and a half. Unbelievably efficient. This is why I wanted to share this with all of you um, today. That, however, is just one of the modules. What we also have is we have ask a question. So you can ask it any question you want, um, any jurisdiction. If you say the jurisdiction, it'll recognize it. One of the challenges that I know I have sometimes is remembering the difference between claim preclusion and issue preclusion. So I'm going to ask it, uh, what is the difference between issue and claim preclusion? And let's say, uh, give an example. Let's see what that, I'm going to add, try that before. Let's see. Ask a question. So issue preclusion and claim preclusion are legal doctrines related to principle of res judicata, which is absolutely correct, a matter judged, which prevents a party from litigating a matter that has already been decided. Issue preclusion, also known as collateral estoppel, 
relitigate an issue of fact. For example, suppose party A or sues party B for breach of contract. Court determines B did not did indeed breach the contract. Party A later sues party B for damages resulting from the same breach. Party B cannot argue that he did not breach the contract because that issue has been conclusively decided in the first suit. Claim preclusion, also known as res judicata, deals with the claim. And then here's an example. Okay, great, plain vanilla, plain English example that allows us to figure out you know, how to approach this particular issue if we have it with a client. So very helpful. Next, we have client ID. So this is that was ask a question module. We did discovery requests. Now we're going to do client intake and claim ID. What this does is it gives you, it'll identify claims that potentially are present based on a fact pattern by the uh, provided by the, the caller, provided by the potential new client. Uh, this will be helpful whether a client is once they're signed up but also maybe before they're signed up, if you wanna evaluate a claim to see whether it's worthwhile, you can actually include it here. So I'm gonna indicate Ohio. If you have any unusual claims, if you're aware of something off the wall, you can type it in here and then it'll analyze it for that. I'm just gonna leave it blank. We also have the ability to do is ask for follow-up questions. So we're gonna give it a fact pattern, but we're also gonna say, let's ask it five, um, five additional questions that can help us develop that fact pattern more or develop the claim, the potential claim for the client. And I'll show you what I mean by that once we actually use it. And then we enter a description of whatever the, the fact pattern might be. Um, we'll say um, uh, Bob was riding bike uh, around um, through a store's parking lot and one of the employees of the store driving the snowplow truck him. And he was severely, and he was injured. Submit issue. And it's going to give us, it's going to analyze both state and potential federal claims. If you have a claim, if you have a fact pattern that implicates federal law, I don't think this is going to, but we'll see what it says. But it's going to tell us here uh, negligence, certainly PI claim based on negligence, vicarious liability, responding at superior, the store against the store, premises liability, the liability, liable conditions of parking lot contributed to the accident. For example, if there's hazards, Wrongful death, if it, the uh, injuries were fatal. Loss of consortium, if Bob was married. Product liability, if snowplow is defective. Workers' compensation, if Bob was employed by the store, was performing his job duties. And then generally it's telling you that it probably doesn't implicate federal claims unless a uh, federal entity or there's a question of civil rights involved. So you have a nice, robust series of of potential claims that this person might be able to to bring and whether or not you bring each one of them it's a good backstop to to get an idea of what might be possible and then here's your follow-up questions so if you want to develop them more to to feel more confident with the claims or ensure that the or get more information from the client to boost up your your uh, complaint then here's some additional questions that you can ask follow-up questions Excuse me, could you please provide more details? Nature of the injuries, appear to be following any specific company protocol or guidelines, visible warning signs, uh, report the incident store management, local enforcement. Did you receive any response or action from them? Any additional information sort of prior incidents or complaints related to the operation of their snow plows? So this is just five questions. If we wanted more, we can have more. If we didn't want to skip it, you can just put a zero. It's a nice, healthy way to validate claims as well as as you're drafting a complaint to put things in here to make sure you're getting everything. Now, here's what's uh, lastly, I'm going to show you the fourth one you've got done. It, once you put the lawsuit together, you want to validate that you have all of the allegations, the factual allegations in support of the elements. First, you want to make sure you've got all your elements in the complaint, but you also want to make sure that you have the factual allegations supporting each one of those elements. 
this this product this module allows you to test that out what you do is you actually paste the whole lawsuit right here what i'm going to do is i'm going to go to a uh, sample lawsuit we have uh, this is a fake one but it deals with uh, a mother who uh, whose daughter sold a property and um, the daughter promised to give her the money and they didn't and we've got a couple of claims now we, we I, I reduce this down to fraudulent inducement as well as conversion for the sake of uh, time but this could have additional claims in fact what I'll do is I will take just the introduction and I'm going to copy just the introduction we have without the claim, so it doesn't know any of the claims. And we're going to go back to what we just were at, that same uh, functionality. We're going to do uh, claim and take claim ID. We're going to enter the just the fact patterns in, select Ohio. We're going to run this, submission, submit this issue, and see what claims the AI recommends that we should be bringing as part of this particular lawsuit. We've got breach of fiduciary duty version okay we know we got we got that in there fraud financial exploitation exploitation of an elderly person maybe under ohio's elder abuse laws iied breach of contract unjust enrichment abuse and neglect federal level Elder Justice Act, I didn't even know this existed. Violation of powers of, of attorney laws. I don't know if there's a private cause of action for that. But, and then follow up questions. Here's some additional follow up questions. So we've got a handful. We are just going to vote. We already know we've got fraud and conversion. So we're going to go back to that complaint. And I am going to now copy the whole complaint that we have with limited to the fraudulent inducement and conversion fraud and conversion and we're going to go back and i'm just going to go to that lawsuits analyze we're going to paste the whole lawsuit right here we're going to have a, uh, an upload uh, potential uh, or ability soon where you can just upload a, a word document or, or a pdf and then it'll run it through so this can actually be used as you're trying to evaluate whether a motion to dismiss is appropriate if our clients the defense uh, if your client's a defendant, then you can take plaintiff's complaint, upload it, and then it'll analyze it for the actual claims. It'll recognize the causes of action. Here we've got fraudulent inducement. And then it'll give you the actual elements, representation of the falsity, materiality, reliance. And then it describes which what the element is. For example, it refers to the plaintiff having relied on the false statement and making their decision, which in turn resulted in harm. Jane alleges that she relied on Lauren's false representation resulting in financial loss and emotional distress. It's even citing paragraphs, which it sometimes does, to support, again, the, the element, the description of the element and the factual support. Conversion is the second one. Four elements, again, the element, description of the element, and the application of facts. And then down at the end, it'll give in says, given that Jane has alleged facts that cover each one of these elements, motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim may not be advisable at this time. However, if more facts come available, then, then maybe. So you've got even analysis at the very end. It'll tell you whether or not a motion to dismiss is, is appropriate based on the, the facts alleged. Uh, that's, this, that's this final product. So... The four things we've got done, uh, ask, a, ask a question, client intake, lawsuit to analyze, discover responses. Um, I will tell you that we are actually working on, next is drafting an actual answer. Uh, maybe the time you're, we're, you're actually using the product, well, this will be done. What it will do is actually go through and um, deny each one of the allegations unless you indicate that it should be admitted. And then it will identify defenses and affirmative defenses both standard ones that are used in light of the lawsuit that was filed and the facts of the lawsuit, but also then uh, for the client factual situation um, that might apply. For example, if the client indicates in a breach of contract action that they attempted to pay and the plaintiff refused payment, it will recognize that that would be the doctrine of failure to mitigate damages and will add that in as the legal doctrine 
based on the factual support for it. So we're working on that. That should be done again uh, fairly soon. You might be seeing it once you get in. Um, more more functionality to, to come, including drafting complaint and um, and discovery uh, down the road. But uh, but I hope that just as it is right now, you find it incredibly helpful, beneficial, and an incredibly time-saving resource for you. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, thanks, everybody, for spending the time here.